Hello. All right, let's get started. Like now. Okay. Shout something. Hi. Oh, it's not on. It is on. Yeah. Oh, it's on. Hello. Cease talking. Thank you. Great. Welcome back from Labor Day. Um, I hope you had a nice three-day weekend. You didn't uh, labor too hard, um, and then you're and then you're back and ready to uh, get talking about match data. Um, so I'm gonna uh, we're gonna finish off match analysis today, um, and hopefully we'll have a few minutes later where I'm gonna tap out, and then this guy's gonna come in and start uh, modeling strategy. Uh, in a light, in a light way, in just in the last few minutes. Um, I think of housekeeping. Uh, the recording from Thursday's lecture is not online. That is not my fault. Um, <laughs> there's a uh, the. It's his fault. Uh, that's right. Um, the there was just a technical issue that they're looking into. So I'm going to put online last year's um, last year's version of that same lecture. And you get to evaluate how consistent or not I am in like what I say in terms of content or jokes or hopefully the jokes are, are spontaneous or I don't know. Um, so uh, and I think that's the only real thing to talk about is that. So that'll be online today. And so we, we were talking about matched data, uh, uh, matched analyses and matching and what that's about. We're more, we're more talking about matching rather than matched analysis uh, last time, and we'll talk about uh, that, the analysis portion today. The labs are a little ahead of where I am right now, and, and the, but we're going to kind of close that gap today, and we'll get back on, on schedule here. I just like talking to you all so much, so we're a little behind. Um, so we talked about matching really as a, something that's used across study designs. Um, and we, and we, we said that it really, it's this idea of kind of arranging the, uh, an index and comparison group to have the exact uh, confounder distribution that you want through this process of identifying the compa comparison people that have similar, that are similar or the same to the index group people based on these confounding characteristics. So, um, and that happens when in a case control study where you have cases and you go out and find controls that look a lot like them on the factors of interest. And in the, co in a, in the cohort or you know, trial type designs, it's really the exposure, uh, the exposed, you're, you're finding exposed and unexposed that kind of uh, look you know, the same on the features of interest. And there's a number of benefits for this. Um, it could be a, a very efficient way to control for confounding, uh, and you can have a big gain in, um, in confounding control. You can come, you could it, it, control for what I called complex confounders, where really you can kind of, uh, you know, if you control for household through matching, there's a whole lot of information that goes into what makes up a household. It's, it's family, common family history, genetics, environmental exposures, whatever, that's all baked into the concept of household. And so if you can match on household, you're, you're getting many birds with one stone. So that's what I call by the complex confounder control. And then, and then with that also comes variable reduction. I didn't have to go measure the 1,000 things that makes your household your household. I just have the fact that you're in that same house. So um, matching can be a very, very powerful technique. And we talked about, we, this is really where we were ending off, was in the middle of talking about different methods for matching. There was kind of this individual matching and then frequency matching. Um, and individual matching is where you are really uh, recruiting in a, in a very specific way, one-to-one, two-to-one, so forth, uh, controls that look like your cases on the factors of interest. So here we had uh, sex, age, and race. And we were really very specifically finding matches uh, for specific cases. Um, whereas in the frequency matching situation, uh, they're really generally matching the distribution of the confounders and the control group to that of the uh, case group or the exposed and unexposed. So you're not necessarily recruiting a specific hey, you, you this control, you go with that case, but rather, in a general sense, constructing your controls to match uh, that of the cases. And so I had a few questions at the end of the last class about, well, 
you know, I think with me on the next slide, even, I talked about, um, well, it's, so, it's somewhere in here. But basically, you don't have to do, you could, there's other ways to even, oh, this is it. I said independently set the distribution. So what I meant by this was, here in this example, there's three variables, sex, age, and race. And here we have exactly that 12% of the cases are female, young, purple, or purple, let's say. And then therefore, we're going to go find 12% of our controls to exactly uh, have, that have that intersection of features. There's other ways to think about this. You could have independently looked at the sex distribution and said, well, it's about 60-40 male-female. Let's make our, our comparison group 60-40 male-female. And then I could have looked at age and I could have looked at race as separate entities and try to generally balance on all three of those independently. So that's another way to even think about this. Uh, there's no rules to this, but this, these are all ways to think about matching in a group-wise kind of way. Obviously, you lose, a little bit of, you lose a little bit of something when you're independently coming up with the matching uh, rather than jointly thinking about all three of them in the way that this example has. So, you know, in, in choosing all of this, it's about uh, convenience and what make really what what's possible in your study design in your situation if you're you know what the availability um, of controls is and it's I think this this is just uh, yeah it's an operational choice um, and I'm gonna I'm trying to get us to analysis here so we're going to jump through this I think the last another piece to think about is that when we talk about in the, in the language of matching uh, what a question that comes up is how many controls do we match to each case? So in the, in the examples that we all did in the spring, we were generally thinking about one-to-one -one matching where you have one control per case. But you can imagine that you know, cases in the, in the case control designer, they're, kind of, they're the rare limiting thing. You have 15 people sick with X and you're trying to quickly figure out what is causing X. And so uh, what you may have a lot of at, at your disposal are controls, right? You may, they, these 15 people exist in a community, they exist in a hospital or the church picnic or whatever the examples we like using. And you may have more controls available to you to match to those cases. And so you might entertain other designs such as, you know, R to 1, which we mean um, as, um, sorry, as, you know, let's say R is the number of controls, let's say four controls or five controls per case. Um, and we, or you might consider RI to one, which means for one group, I, for one case I found three controls, for another case I found five, and you might vary the number of controls per case depending on what you are able to do. You may not always find enough, you, may, you have actual recruitment limitations and you may not actually identify um, the same number of controls per case. Or you might see other designs where you maybe do have uh, two cases, let's say, this is what this S means, S sub I, you may have multiple cases matched to multiple controls. So you can imagine there's any of these types of situations. Usually what you'll see is maybe one to one or R I to one where you have either exactly one control or um, as many as you could find per case, per one case. And again, this is really dependent on this, the specific situation that you have. The benefit of having more controls per case is you, you're getting more data. You have more of a sample size, right? Why in your pair match tables have just two individuals, as we'll, we'll go over the pair match table kind of I mean, uh, layout, but maybe you can get four or five people in one, uh, in one table uh, to make your, uh, to do your stratified analysis on, let's say. And so there's a gain in precision um, and, in, and in including more controls per case. Uh, but the thing is, is that actually it's, it's a diminishing returns. If I went and recruited a million controls per case, uh, that probably wouldn't give me that much more over half, you know, half a million controls per case. Right? There's some point at which adding more controls per case is, is a diminishing yield. And then we have this kind of rule in thumb in, in epidemiology that it's maybe once you hit about four or five controls per case, you start to really lose the efficiency. You lose, it's not as efficient to add, keep adding more controls uh, per case that you've kind of maxed out what you can do on precision at that point. 
Um, again, nothing here is written in stone, uh, but these are just some uh, principles to think about. Um, and so, and when you think about should it be matched, like I've suggested, there's a whole lot. To, there's, a, there's a whole lot to think about with whether you um, you you match or not. I, I think the idea here is that you really want to match on strong conf on strong potential confounders. Um, where you really, and so what you, in such that matching on them will give you a big gain in confounding control and precision. If we didn't match on this, we'd be, you know, we'd just be stupid. We'd be missing the boat. We'd be, we'd have a, a compromised analysis. We didn't match on household. We didn't match on hospital or whatever it is. These big kind of elephants in the room that if we don't deal with them in the study design, we're going to have a bet, we're going to get the wrong answer. Uh, the, you know, other, as I've suggested a number of times, matching has a lot of logistical overhead, right? And so you have to be able to actually find and establish those controls to that these matches uh, before a study enrolls, um, right? So you have to be able to have some sampling frame or some way to recruit those controls in a reason reasonable way. Right, and so that may not always be possible in your situation. Right, you may not have a directory of the sex, age, race, you know, dis distribution of your community. Let's say, or some, or you may, or you, may, but you may, if it's a hospital-based study, and you have hospital records that you can comb through and identify controls from, or maybe it's that you're putting out advertisements and saying, "I need controls that look like this," and you get people that way. So there's many different implementation things to think about. Um, but one, one piece that is very important in the logistics is this bullet down here about you, you have to, you can only match on things that you can ascertain before you actually enroll someone in your study, right? So I would really love to match somebody on blood glucose levels. Well, the problem is you can't get someone's blood glucose level without getting their blood, and getting their blood means they're enrolled in your study, which means you've already consented to them. Right, there's this whole long chain of things operationally that you would have had to do in order to get that strong confounder to match upon. And so certain factors are, that you would actually love to match on are just impossible given how we conduct human subjects research. Um, so again, another thing to think about, you, you, so you probably cannot match on blood glucose level, at least in the design of the study. You may do some analytical where you may include, you may deal with it in the analysis in some ways later, and you may try to, you could even think of interesting matched analyses downstream, but in the, in the design of the study, you, you can't, you can't match on a factor that requires enrolling the study. Um, and um, the, this last bullet, I think, we're going we're gonna to definitely get back to later today, which is when you match on a factor, you are unable to assess its relationship uh, to the exposure or disease process in the actual analysis. So there's this trade-off with when we match. It's this. It is a. It's a panacea in terms of beautiful confounding control. You eliminate confounding on that factor perfectly. You're guaranteed to pretty much. Uh, but that comes at the expense of not being able to assess it in the analysis itself. So if you match on sex, age, or color purple, green, as we had in those uh, figures, we actually lose the ability to talk about those factors in the analysis. Um, and we'll see what, how that works uh, coming up. So really, the, the moral of the story is we should really match only on the strong risk factors that we think are going to be confounders and that we can feasibly match upon. So what do we do uh, once we've done our study perfectly? And you fast forward a year, two years, and now it's time to analyze it. What are we going to do with our match, our match data? And so there's kind of two, uh, as we're seeing with everything in this course, there's kind of the uh, previous way and the new way. And the, the previous way is uh, thinking of this as a stratified analysis problem. Um, and for that, we use mantle Hansel methods. And we talked about that in, in FE 534 um, in some detail. And we're going to review that briefly today without um, all of the intermediate steps. So there's stratified analysis, table-based approaches to analyzing match data. But we'll see that that kind of breaks down and we have to actually, uh, it's limited, I don't say breaks down, it works, but in a very limited set of conditions. And to more deeply, uh, to analyze more deeply, more complex situations involving match data, we're gonna need to use logistic regression uh, methods. 
And so just as a one quick snapshot of why, why we might want to use logistic regression, in the mantle hand cell methods, we were only able to deal with, in the analysis, the matched factors themselves for control. So if we matched on age, sex, and race, our analysis was limited to the control, the, the adjustment for the matching, which dealt with age, sex, and race. Um, and that was, you remember using the, the McNamara's odds ratio, uh, which we showed was equivalent to the Mantle-Hansel odds ratio. But we cannot actually deal with ma factors not matched upon. But what if, as we suggested, let's say with blood glucose, or here we have uh, blood pressure, BMI, activity level, other factors that you measured in the course of your study, you did your matching on age, sex, and race, you bring people in for your project and you're measuring all sorts of interesting um, exposures and outcomes or whatever you're doing, and you might along the way collect some other stuff that you may decide you want to control for, such as you know, these other factors here, none of which are really apparent at the matching level. I mean, you can maybe eyeball someone's BMI and say you look like a great control, um, but you know, generally these are things that would have been ascertained in the, in the, in the conduct of the study. You can't deal with these really at, uh, effectively at all in the stratified analysis, but in, log in the logistic regression incarnation of this, we'll be able to. So that's really nice. Um, and remember, a couple other things that we had talked about was that um, you, if you do a match design, you need to do a matched analysis. That's kind of the golden rule here. Match design, match analysis. If you don't, you are going to um, create problems. Um, which will appear as either bias problems or, or loss of precision problems, depending on the study design. And so uh, you, will, you will induce problems that you don't need to be inducing um, by ignoring the match design and the analysis. Um, and so in the pair match situation, the individual kind of pair, pair match situation, we get data that looks in this kind of layout. So this is the layout that we're going to use on the upcoming slides. I don't know what happened to the rest of the unexposed here. But imagine we did a pair match study. We recruit a pair four. Um, and it's a case, let's say it was a case control study. The data layout uh, looks something like this. We get tables that have just two people in them, because it's a pair match study. And the rows sum up to one, because there's one case and one control. And the type of data that we're looking at here are whether um, the, case, the case is exposed or unexposed, and the control is exposed or unexposed. So here in this, imagine you recruited pair four. They're, you know, let's say they're purple, female, briefcase carrying females, or as, you know, these little, these little people here. This is pair four. And in this case, the case was unexposed and the control was exposed. Uh, and in here, both the case and the control are exposed. So this is the type of data we're looking at, kind of these very restricted tables of very small numbers of people. Um, and the rows are summing up to the number of cases and controls. In this situation, if these were both the same groups, let's say that this was a purple um, briefcase uh, female, and then let's say both pairs four and six met this criteria, we actually may even talk about pooling these match sets into one kind of mega stratum, right? Nothing actually differentiates the cases and the controls um, in this case if they actually were the same on all of their um, on, on the matching criteria, so they were all, if they all met these three demographic conditions, you may actually say, well, why don't we just put them together? And we'll, I'll show an example of that as well. Um, so there is maybe an advantage to kind of putting those together. And you might say, well, how did that happen? Well, it might have been that pair four and pair six were recruited three months apart, right? So at the time, when the first purple briefcase female was recruited, there was, a, there was one control available, and then another case develops a little bit later, and that becomes pair six. And so operationally, there may be this time lag or some actual reason why they were set, you know, considered as separate entities, and we can later put them together. So um, that's actually, in fact, what I just said here. Of course, I, I, keep, I keep preempting myself, which I did last time. Um, but here's, here's a situation where we might do that. So here, 
and imagine you have some cases up here, some diseased folks, and some uh, controls over here on the bottom, undiseased folks. And this is the order in which they came in, one through six. Note that groups, uh, uh, yeah, pairs one and four um, are effectively the same on the matching criteria, and same with two, three, five, and six. And so you may actually just consider these as two groups, two kind of mega groups in the analysis. So even though the study was conducted this way, this is actually analytically how we might better deal with it. Um, just to, again, get some more statistical precision by putting more people in, into one table. So that's this, this idea of pooling. Um, and there's, you know, if, if to the extent that they actually do match and there's no reason why one in four should be in different groups, uh, this makes a lot of sense. So, um, we're going to talk about this in a moment um, when we talk about logistic regression for all of this. But the idea here is that, in theory, we could we know that we can do stratified what we were formerly doing as stratified analyses with logistic regression. That's what we spent the last week and a half talking about. Um, and so, so too, we could actually, in theory, construct a logistic regression model that mimicked the stratified analysis that we know from matched analysis. And I'm, I'm going to walk us through that in a better in a better way in a moment. So when we did the, um, in, in, last, in last spring, when we did matched analysis, we were thinking about the stratified approach mainly. And we saw that in the pair matched situation, there was really only four ways that this can go. Um, when you have one case and one control, and you're considering who is exposed and unexposed, there's only four configurations. Right, there's, and we gave them letters, W, X, Y, Z. The Ws were, uh, in this configuration, where both the case and the control were exposed. Or you could have the Zs, where both the case and the control were unexposed, which again, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm missing the rest of my, the top part here. So these are, these are uh, two extremes, where both are exposed or both are unexposed. Those are kind of boring. Right? They don't really tell us much about whether exposure is associated with uh, being a case or not. Right? We did this case control study because we want to figure out, is, the, what, is this exposure associated with being a case or not? So we could make some, uh, make some um, statement about the risk of being a case based on the exposure. And these are boring because they don't really give us any new information. They're both, the case and the control both are the same. But what gets interesting is these X and the Y configurations where you have a case is exposed and a control's not, um, which would tell us, hmm, looks like there's some evidence that the cases tend to be more exposed than the control. Uh, and the opposite direction is the Y situation where you have a case is unexposed and a control is exposed. And remember the, the, this idea of the McNamara uh, statistic is, uh, and, and, the, and the odds ratio based on that was looking at the balance of the X's to the Y's, right? If we have more of these situations, more cases that tend to be exposed instead of the controls relative to the reverse situation, that builds the evidence that the exposure is a risk factor for, for, being, for disease. And so the, it's the balance of these two that's interesting and the other two are kind of boring uh, because they're, uninf they're uninformative. The, the, the cases and the controls agree. Now in the uh, R to one matching situation, the tables, there's you know, many possible tables. There's not just this closed universe of four tables. And so here, imagine a three to one matching situation. You can get a table that looks like this, right? One case, three controls, that's the three to one. And you can get a case is exposed, and then you get, um, you have uh, two controls, that are exposed and one control that's unexposed. So this is, uh, you know, one of many tables that you can get depending on the different number of controls per case. And you don't have this simple uh, closed solution. You can still use the uh, Mantle-Hansel methods to analyze this kind of table, but the McNamara statistic that we taught, well, that I'll show in a slide or two only applies to the pair matching uh, situation. Uh, which is exactly what we said here. So this is, these are the, this is really the universe of, of things that we're talking about with the stratified approach to the case control analysis. 
And we showed in Epi 534 that these are all the same, actually, for the pair match situation, that the, the McNamara odds ratio is the mantle hansel odds ratio that reduces the same exact thing. Um, and the example that, uh, kind of a classic example for demonstrating this is the, uh, this analysis by Breslow and Day of uh, hormone replacement therapy in uh, postmenopausal women uh, being associated with uh, endometrial cancer. And there were a number of studies that went on, uh, this is in the 70s and in the 80s, looking at hormone replacement therapy and in a variety of gynecological cancers. And this one's looking at endometrial cancer. And, and here, um, uh, you know, the exposure in, in among 63 uh, pairs was uh, estrogen hormone replacement therapy and then cancer case status is the outcome. And then we have uh, several matching factors, age, marital status, and then uh, date of entrance to the community. So kind of a time, uh, another time-based control factor. And so here we have 63 pairs. Uh, exposure is uh, uh, hormone replacement therapy. Outcome is the cancer and cancer case. And what you get is the data set that looked like this, where we have 27, uh, uh, 27 uh, pairs where both the case and the control are exposed. Um, four where neither were, so you can just get a sense this is probably, this is very prevalent, this is a very prevalent therapy at the time. Um, and because we have 27 situations where both the case and the control are exposed. And then here you see that 29 pairs of women uh, have a situation where the case is exposed and the control is not. And then only three in the opposite situation where the control was exposed, but the cancer case was unexposed. And so the, this, you should just eyeball this and say, huh, that's, that's quite an imbalance. We have 29 saying yay association and three, three tables saying nay to the association. And so there's this tug of war, there's this tension between these two, and that's formalized um, by the, the mantle hansel Ah, the mantle hansel or McNamara odds ratio, this is really the McNamara form formulation of it, which is X over Y. So that tension between the 29 and the 3 um, is actually formalized as 29 divided by 3, gives you the odds ratio uh, for the association between the exposure and, and, and disease. And uh, the Way to summarize those four, those, we had four tables previously. We, had w, we, had, we said this is the number of W's, the number of X's, the number of Y's, and the number of Z's. You, we, we also can summarize it in this uh, layout where we have, uh, this is a different two by two table. We love two by two tables. This is a different two by two table. This one has not individuals representing each um, unit in the cells, but it, each one represents a pair. And this is a way to summarize the, the number of W, X, Y, Z pairs. All right, so the W's were where the case and the control, case, control, are both exposed. The Z's were the number of cases and controls that were unexposed. And then the X's and the Y's can be populated in here. So this is just another shorthand way to summarize the, the four tables we had before. You didn't have to do this. You didn't have to make this in order to make, use these formulas. But this is a convenient way of summarizing the group experience into a single summary. And so that X over Y tension is the, is the matched odds ratio over here. Uh, and similarly, there's, the, the, there's a chi-square statistic, which is X minus Y squared over X plus Y, which is the, um, gives you the test of whether the odds ratio is equal to one or not, that, that null hypothesis of uh, equals one, uh, versus the alternative of not equals one. And then here we also had a formula uh, for the uh, confidence interval. This is the 95% confidence interval um, uh, for the, the odds ratio. Okay, so this is all the McNamara formulation of the mantle hansel statistic that you would compute on these stratified tables. And so what this turns out here, here's what, the, what you get for the specific endometrial cancer example, we have this 29 versus 3, which gives you an odds ratio of 9.67, so a strongly positive association between exposure and disease. 
And here we see um, it uh, gives you a chi-square statistic with 21.1, um, otherwise known as uh, uh, highly significant because this is a chi-square with one degree of freedom distribution. And this would be a highly significant uh, p-value. And so, um, and we also have a confidence interval that's rather wide between 3 and 32. Okay, so this is, this is all old hat. This is what we, we did uh, previously. Here's, I just threw up some SAS code here. This is, um, this is, I actually put, this is on Blackboard. I just, it's in the SAS code area. But this is actually how you might want to um, conduct this kind of analysis in SAS, which might be of interest to you. And here I'm actually showing it um, for uh, homework two. Um, so that might be of more interest. And uh, this is from question 10. So an easy way to do this analysis in SAS is you got to actually make parametric. Yeah, if I gave you summary data, you have to make parametric. You have to make individual responses that match kind of this parametric situation. So if I gave you a W, X, Y, Z kind of layout table, you have to make individual responses in a data set in SAS in order to actually analyze the data. SAS does not natively take this format. It does not care for your pair match data, where one, one unit represents two people. It doesn't want that. It actually wants respondents. And so here's a little quick way to do this, uh, where you can plug in a W, X, Y, Z. And then here, what I'm doing is outputting two observations per, uh, per one. Here, let's say this is looping. This is a do loop. Do people, do people know do loops? You do do loops. OK, good. Um, so here, if I have two, W is two, it's going to do this, run this code twice. From one to two, it's going to make two people. So it's going to make four people for two matched pairs, um, where uh, the, well, you have a case and the control are both uh, exposed, basically, is what it, it I mean, um, is, what, is what we're doing. So the, sorry, everyone's exposed. The case, uh, case one and case zero represents case and control status, and they're both exposed is what it's doing. And then it's stamping each record with this thing called stratum. And so the first folks are going to be called stratum one, and then one, and then two, and then two. And it's basically an ID number that represents the stratum. OK, so this is how you know I've done this for you, so you don't have to think about it too much harder again. Um, but this is how you might want to do this in SAS to make individual level responses. So what it's doing is it's um, going all the way. You can look at what the do is doing here, as it were. But it's basically uh, using, it's counting all the way upwards the number of people and looping through and making all of our W, Xs, Ys, and Zs. OK, and so here is some code for how we're going to, how you can do this in SAS. Um, and this. It just should be familiar. We do tables, stratum by case by exposure, and then you ask for the Mantle Hansel statistic, and this is how you can get uh, that odds ratio that we just saw. Uh, the x over y type odds ratio uh, is one. So, if you have many many strata, you're going to get a lot of outputs. So you're going to have to suppress some of the output or deal with your screen kind of going crazy for a while. And we're going to talk about this one in a moment, like now. Uh, any questions on the stratified approach? Okay, logistic regression for matched analysis here. Okay, so we just saw uh, all of this. We just saw the, the, this is the same example. These are the results that we got uh, from the, the, the McNamar uh, slash Mantle Hansel type approach. 9.67 is our odds ratio. But what if you got some extra data later? All right, you, you do your study and you start interviewing people. Now you ask them about, um, now you start asking them about some other things, such as gallbladder disease history, uh, okay, which um, I believe is associated with endometrial cancer. Uh, and so now, uh, this may, you might want to think of this potentially as uh, a confounder, let's say. And so now, this is a new piece of information that came along later. You did not match on it, and you would like to incorporate it into your analysis. So your data might look something like this, right? You have your first pair of women, case, control, exposed, unexposed, let's say. And now you've got this other thing, okay? 
this is uh, the, the gallbladder di uh, disease uh, history variable. Okay, so this is just going to, the data is going to come as you get it, and now you've got to deal with it, and it's not going to follow this predictable case control pattern and this other exposure thing. You have this other variable you want to deal with. How are we going to do that? Okay, well, the problem here is that you can't do stratified analysis on this, right? When we, we can't, you know, we have people that are, let's say, in pair one, they're discordant on, and in pair two, they're discordant on this gallbladder disease status uh, or disease history variable. And we cannot further stratify this table. I mean, we just, we, we cannot further control within this pair for another factor. Right? We've already got, we got two people in this table. That's, that's, a pro, that's problem A. And problem B uh, is, well, that's really, yeah, we, we can't, we can't split them into further ways and think about further stratifying within that pair on gallbladder status. And maybe if the pair, if it wasn't a pair matched analysis, maybe if there were like 15 people in a household, in a, you know, I'm not trying to imagine what the senior community would be like, but you have some, fifth, you know, I don't know, if you had a larger group and you were somehow able to split them up based on their status and stratify within the larger unit, maybe. But the fact is, we just can't here. We have only two people, and they're discorded, and we can't, we can't really deal with this. So they're going to be dropped from the analysis if we try to even um, analyze uh, gallbladder status. Um, so we're going to look at how we're going to do logistic regression in this case. And so what we're going to do is modify the earlier EVW model, and we're going to consider two types of V variables. The ones that are... Uh, we're not just going to be just confounders. We're going to distinguish between ones that represent uh, inter like real, you know, new confounders that we're analyzing, like gallbladder disease status. Let's say the, the actual things that we want to newly control for. But we're also going to account for membership in the match sets. Okay, because remember I said we, if we have an ana we have a matched design, we still need to have a matched analysis, and our logistic model is going to need to deal with um, the matching, and we're going to represent that in these V one I's, and these are going to be dummy variables that represent the uh, you know what pair are you in, what household, what hospital, whatever we're matching on, um, and. Then the V2s are going to, V2Js, as it were, are going to be these other uh, factors that we're accounting for kind of in the usual way. You know, uh, post, you know, in the analysis, these are things we want to deal with uh, way. And then the Ws um, are, we still have Ws, and they're usually going to be just the V2Js, just these other factors that came along later, like gallbladder status. So uh, we're not really going to, entertain effect modification on the match set on the match sets that's just kind of odd um, and we're not going to really we're not going to we're not going to do that and so we're going to get a logistic model now that looks like this okay this looks a lot like the last version of the logistic regression model except now um, instead of having a single sum of gamma times v's for all for all the i v's you know or the k v's that you have uh, we're going to now have two groups of Vs, the ones that pertain to matching and the ones that pertain uh, not to matching, uh, the other factors to control for. So this is just a slight modification of our model that distinguishes between these two types of control factors. Now, the, the, we added only Vs, okay? And so if you remember... Our, our formula for the odds ratio before that we talked about last lecture um, really pertains to, it was e to the beta plus the sum of all the deltas times w's. Remember that we only look at the, the term, the pieces that are involved in, in product terms of the exposure, and those are the effect modifiers. And so our formula for the odds ratio from this model is actually the same. Because we've only we're only modifying how confounders are thought of, and we, we said these all these v's just go away anyway in the odds ratio expression. Um, and so, this is a, effectively uh, you know, this is really business as usual. Now, I I want to just point out, and I think this 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 feels this feels a little funny, but notice that e here in this model. In the um, 
in our situ in our case control design is actually kind of the outcome in a sense, right? You do a case control study. Well, case is really on the left. You know, whether you're a case, that's your disease. That's on the left side of the equal sign. And the exposure, in a sense, is the outcome, right? The thing you set about in your study to discover in a case control study is actually um, the exposure status. But despite that, we still actually maintain this orientation of the model. So they, we're, we're predicting case status, which might feel weird because we already know who is a case. We recruited you based on whether you're a case or a control, right? We've actually, we're fixing, we already know, let's say if it's a one-to-one -one design, we know half the people are cases and half the people are, are, are controls. There's no surprise there. Uh, that being said, we're about, we're estimating the odds ratio, that association between exposure and, and disease. Oops, sorry. Um, and so, the, uh, just something to keep in mind. We're not going to change our usual approach, but just know that in the case control design where we're playing it backwards, we're still keeping the model orientation the same. Okay, so given what I just said, can you use this model to obtain the probability of disease in a case control design? In a one-to-one -one design, do you, in a one-to-one -one matching des case control design, do you need me to, do you need a logistic regression model to figure out the probability of disease? No, it's 50%. That's it. It is, right? It, you've, you have, it is 50% because your study design made it that way. You have, you have decreed it to be um, 50%. Sorry, my phone is going crazy. Um, and so, the, in the, this, this is, I think, a principle that you've seen before in other courses where the case control design is about measuring the exposure disease relationship. It is not set up for figuring out the risk of disease. It is not, you, you, you cannot figure out the risk. You can maybe aspire to the relative risk through the use of the odds ratio, right? And there's, and we're not gonna go into all of the thinking behind that because you've, you've had that several times before. But we wanna measure the odds ratio because we, we would like to talk about the relative risk. We cannot measure the probability of disease. And similarly, uh, you know, our, our model just can't handle that. And so, there's really uh, two flavors of logistic regression, as we've said before. What we've only talked about to date is the unconditional model, um, where um, we have, uh, you know, this is a more typical model modeling situation. And the unconditional model, we use it where we have the number of p parameters is small relative uh, to the number of observations. Okay, so like let's say we had um, just a standard analysis here. Let's say we had an analysis, with a study with 200 people. Let's say, let's say, I says your case control study doesn't have to be, it can be any study. We have 200 subjects, there's no matching, and you're just doing a, an analysis of the association between exposure and disease with controlling for age, sex, and race. And here, let's say we had five parameters, there's five terms in the model. This means we have the P is small relative to N. Five parameters, 200 people. Um, and in this case, we're using, an, we would use an unconditional model, okay? That, this is a perfect, this is a poster situation for using the unconditional model. A few number of terms relative to the number of subjects. Uh, compare that to uh, this other situation. What if we had a similar version of the study that was pair matched? Okay, study, and we pair, we did a, a, a variation of the same idea, 200 subjects, and we pair match them based on their combinations of age, sex, and race. Okay, so two versions of the same study. One is we did no matching, we just control for these things in the model. Just, we just threw them in the model, what's your age, what's your sex, what's your race, and then put in the model. Here, it's in the matching. It's in the match design. Well, the model down here, corresponding to the matched model that we, formula of the model that we just showed would look something like this, alpha plus beta times exposure plus 99 dummy variables to tell us which of the 100 pairs you're in. So that's a lot of variables, right? 99, we had 100 pairs, so we're gonna use 99 dummy variables to represent that. That's 101 terms in your model for your, your poor 200 subjects, that's a lot. That's like, not, that should make you upset, right? You don't want, you're, you, do you know how long it's going to take you to type that on the model line in SAS? And if it's going to go all the way to the right for a while, right? And you're not going to be happy that you have to do that. So 
um, that's, that sh should feel wrong. You don't want to do that. Um, so we're going to invoke what we're going to call the conditional logistic regression model, which is going to stratify on the pairs, and it's going to kind of, in a sense, remove it from the model. Okay? So if you, you know, it, this, if you fit this thing with an unconditional model, if you put, if you, and if you did, so if you did fit this, you typed all this on the model line and you fit it, you fit that, you will get, uh, you will probably get a crazy answer, or an, you'll get a biased answer. Or you are fitting way too many terms in your model relative uh, to the, uh, the number of subjects. So you will get, right? but if you do the conditional model, you will get, you will get an unbiased answer. Um, however, this, the gain in bias comes at a cost of precision, which is that the uh, conditional logistic regression is often a less powerful technique statistically. You will get wider confidence intervals, often really wider. Okay, but at least you are not getting the wrong answer. You're just getting a wider interval around the right answer. So this is, you know, this is where you have to, you know, you know, in certain situations you may have to make this call. Uh, but generally, if you're looking at pair match data, for, for sure, you're going to want to use the conditional logistic regression model. You're not going to fit a standard logistic regression model when, when you have this kind of matching. Okay, so what do we mean by the conditional model? Um, so, uh, more formally, you know, when we're considering this exact, this, this thing on the right column here, when we have pair match data, the, this, uh, the conditional model is going to give you the correct uh, odds ratio, and I said it's going to give you a wrong answer. It's specifically, uh, you're going to get the square of the right answer if you use the unconditional model. Okay, and so if I fit, if I fit this in a regular proc logistic, I'm going to get the square of the correct answer. Not good. Okay, so what, when I'm going to now sh walk through the kind of the conditional analysis uh, using our, our gallbladder example. And so here we have our endometrial cancer folks who are matched on age, marital status, date of entry into community, and then not matched on disease history for gallbladder disease history. We're just going to control for it in the analysis. Uh, this is all kind of, in a sense, baked into what it means to be in a given pair. And so you, the way we're going to control for all of this in the model is, again, by controlling just on the pair itself, on the ID number for which matched pair you're in. So age, marital status, entry into community are not explicitly, in the, not going to be explicitly controlled for, but they're just going to be in, okay, you are in pair 17, congratulations, that means you are this age, this marital status, et cetera, based on how we recruited you. That's going to be kind of all baked into here, whereas Delta 21 times gall, which is the gallbladder disease uh, history, is an actual standard uh, kind of thing that we, we would control for in the model. This says new because the old version of the slides had an I here instead of a one. So if there's an I, just like connect the dot to the I and then you're, you're set. So, uh, so in this model, uh, we have, a, you know, we said there were 63 pairs, so six pairs means two, so there's 126 individuals, and here we see we have an alpha, a beta, 62 deltas, and uh, another delta over here, delta 2-1. That's 65 terms, and we're going to want to use conditional logistic regression. We're not going to want to use the unconditional model, which is going to require, you know, the unconditional model is going to explicitly fit 65 terms to your 126 um, observations, then that's not, that's not cool. We're not going to want to do that. We're going to want these to go away. And the, and the conditional model is going to make these go away by doing the analysis conditional and, and stratifying, in a sense, on all of these pairs. And so when we do this, we're going to get the uh, e to the beta. I'm sorry here. Am I, f I am. Where did you see at home? There's something at home here. <laughs> Terribly sorry. You want me to say something? Say something. <laughs> Let me just point out that Eli was talking about the conditional model. He actually is talking about the model up there on the top is the same model. It's one model you're using. 
what you're using is two different ways to estimate the parameters in that model. One method is called unconditional estimation, and the other method is called conditional estimation. So the model is the same, whether you're doing conditional or unconditional. That's the model at the top of the top of the screen here. Okay, that's the model you're using for either either way. So, but what what Eli is saying is that if you actually did the unconditional model for this match data, you're going to get a biased answer for the odds ratio for the effective exposure. If you did the conditional model, you get an unbiased answer. So, the, so it's not really the mo I mean the conditional versus the unconditional estimation. Okay, so um, and. If you start talking about well, what do you mean by unconditional versus conditional estimation, what are we talking about? He's still working on this. So yes, uh, what are we talking about? How do you get, how do you estimate the parameters in a logistic model? How do you do that? This was something that we talked about the first day or reviewed on the first day. How do you estimate the parameters in a model? You do what's called a certain estimation procedure. What's it called? Maximum likelihood, right? And the way you do maximum likelihood is somehow you get a computer program to get something called a likelihood function. Remember that? A likelihood function. And then you get the program to maximize the likelihood function and give you estimates for the maximized likelihood function. Well, it turns out that if you're doing unconditional maximum likelihood estimation, the likelihood function is not the same as the likelihood function for conditional. That's why it's got a different name. That's why it's got it's a got different a name. name. So what you're doing is you're doing two different approaches to getting an answer that's fitting a model. One approach is going to give you an unbiased answer, and the other approach is going to give you a biased answer. So if you do the, if you do the unconditional approach when you do matching, you're using this model. If you're using a conditional approach, you're using this model. But you're going to get the wrong answer right. if you do the unconditional approach. Back, sir. Baby with a fever, I'm sorry. Baby with a fever. I know. Oh. So, sorry. <laughs> sorry. My, my baby is 45 years old. Well, <laughs> but, yeah, so four months old with a fever. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Okay. It was a disclosure of health information, I should tell the IRB. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay, so we're going to do the, con the conditional model. And um, so, again, from this model here, you know, you know, regardless of whether it's really how we're asking SAS to do it, actually, we, we really want to get, you know, we want the odds ratio, no matter, and we know that the V terms are going to cancel out uh, conveniently when we take the ratio of the odds. Um, and so the form of, uh, you know, an odds of, of, let's say, the odds ratio when we have effect modification, let's say in the model, um, would look something like this. Uh, we have delta 1 times exposure times gallbladder status now in the model. This is, I'm showing a different model with effect modification, how would things change. If we, we might consider exposure and gallbladder disease status, we can now make our usual kind of odds ratio expression, either the beta hat plus uh, delta 1 times gall. So here, this is, so notice we've extended our usual kind of model stuff. It's business as usual. We just got these terms for the paired IDs in them. So really this is not Again, nothing's really changing here other than we've got these control factor. We have these dummy variables in here to represent the, um, the membership and the pairs. Um, and we, have, we can add things like effect modification, as usual, um, with these other V variables that we've entered into the model. Okay, and so how are we going to go about doing this in SAS? We're, we're going to use proc logistic, but we're going to now use something called the strata statement. And the strata statement is asking SAS to do conditional logistic regression. And the conditional, the conditional logistic model under the hood is, in a sense, it's forming the likelihood separately for each stratum of data. It's basically when it, the, the expression, the probability-like looking mathematical expression is going to be the product of many, many, many like small likelihoods for each stratum of the data. Okay, that's really what it's doing under the hood. It's not doing the, it's, it's splitting, it is, it is stratifying the data and making many, many small likelihoods out of it, in a sense, kind of conditioning 
um, it's conditioning on which um, uh, match set you're in. And so the strata statement is going to tell SAS, hey, what am I stratifying on? Um, and what the, what the answer to that is going to be, it's going to be on, in our case, pair ID. You're, you're telling it to stratify on uh, pair ID. And so the data layout, uh, you know, again, is going to look something like this. Um, the required elements in your data are pair ID or whatever identifies the strata, the, dis the case or the disease, and the exposure status. And then here come all the other stuff, the V2Is or V2Js, as it were, um, and the W terms and all the other data that you collected is going to hang out, in our case, to the right over here. Um, and what's nice here is you should probably also have a study ID to keep track of individuals. If you don't do that, you're going to get really confused later. Um, so please do that uh, anyway in your data. And so uh, this, again, is the, the data layout that we're dealing with. Um, and so in this case, in this endometrial cancer example, we want to have, we hope we have 126 observations because that's going to correspond to 63 pairs. So pair ID is 1 to 63 will be 126 people. Um, and so this is what we do in SAS that's a little different. The, uh, the model is going to look like this. Model case equals est and gall, and est is the estrogen exposure variable there, estrogen. Um, gall is gallbladder disease history. So that is in the model here. Um, this is our exposure, and this is our V2-1. But here, not on the model line goes the, 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 the pair ID. And so now SAS is going to do, it's going to switch the tracks from doing a, an, uncon, an unconditional model to the conditional model. And it's going to stratify on pair ID. And it's going to give you output that looks, uh, you know, kind of similar, but with one key difference. And so uh, this, these two things are interchangeable. They're this, when you see, this, this is going to tell us, okay, we have V1 matching type variable, dummy variables over here. Um, and those are going to be called, uh, those are the pair IDs, those are the, those are, that's over here. And then we have a, a, a traditional kind of ex exposure variable and V variable uh, that's delta to one gall. Okay, so this, this means the same as this. This is very different, okay, what, the wrong way to do this is this, don't do this. Okay, never do this. Okay, if you do class pair ID, what have you done? You basically are switching to a, a regular old unconditional model. Like you imagine you could have done something like this, I'd be more precisely this, right? Say, so look, I want to control for all the pair IDs, make me 99 dummy variables. This actually would save you from typing 99 variables, right? 99 dummy variables on the model statement. This might be the, if, you, if I gave you this formula and said, but if I gave you, oh no. Okay. So if I gave you this and said, put this into SAS, and you did this, this might, this might be your first naive swing at this. You'd say, I want 63 or 62 uh, dummy variables, and I want to represent this thing called pair ID. Put it in like this. Give me 62 dummy variables, please. Um, this is going to run the unconditional model and you will get uh, a bias wrong, you will get the wrong answer and you'll, your output just may look weird because you're going to have, you know, a lot of dummy variables represented in the output. So don't do that. Um, I'm going to undo, oh no, I can't even undo it. So, you know, you know what, you know what to do. Uh, okay, so you have it in the, in the strata statement. Okay, so you have, uh, straight up pair ID, give me uh, Aston and Gall and all of that. So what's not in the output here, what's missing? Right, there's three types of variables on the right side of the equal sign, an exposure, a whole lot of V1 I's and a V2 one representing Gall. So all of the stuff, all the dummy variables representing the uh, membership in the pairs is gone. And that's, I mean, that's okay. You don't really miss them, do you? You don't really care about them. You wanted to control for them. The stratification means you stratify on them, but you cannot estimate their effects. But that's okay because did you really care about a specific pair anyway? Did you really want to estimate the effect of being in 
um, you know, older you know, couple, woman couple, 72, I mean, or no, there's not, there's not 72, 12, right? The, the, the specific effects of the strata, in a sense, we didn't care about. We needed a control for it because we matched on them. But we don't miss not being, est being able to estimate a beta for, you know, pair number 17. We don't care, and, and that's okay, but when we've controlled for them. Because what we actually care about is this thing, right? We care about the exposure, right? So we, um, that's the actual thing that we care about. We want to get the odds ratio for est. So, in, um, I'm sorry, here uh, the odds ratio is it's just e to the beta, and it's 9.1. Okay, so this is an unbiased estimate um, of the odds ratio controlling for gallbladder status and the matching. How do we know we actually controlled for the matching? Did SAS do anything different? Well, it told us it's conditional, so we're just gonna have to trust it, I guess. Uh, it, it did, it is. It's actually, it says it's gonna say conditional. There's also a table at the top that's gonna say like number of strata. It's gonna start giving you some information that will hopefully start to make you reassured that it did the right thing. Um, it will tell you that it controlled for 62 strata uh, and so forth. Sure. Yes? Suppose you go back a couple of slides when you show the well, yep. Uh, so the the uh, computer code. Wait, uh, more more back here. Where is it? Uh, okay. Ah. There. okay, that's the computer code that you would use if you were doing unconditional. That's right. Right. Yep. If you're going to do the thing unconditional. That would be the computer. If you can use when you use conditional, you would change class to straight. Right. And you replace and you put pair ID. So that's right. Put, Right, that's what you originally had. It wasn't right. letting me edit. Oh, now it's letting me edit. Yes, right. So there you go. And then you get rid of that. Okay, here's my question. Suppose you left out the straight thing. The first line. Suppose you had the first line. You left out the second line. And you put the third line in the run statement. What would happen? Are you doing, are you doing conditional maximum likelihood estimation? What are you doing? You're doing unconditional because there's no straight statement. Are you doing the same thing that Eli was saying when you had that class statement with the pair ID? Are you doing that? So what, what model are you fitting? You're fitting the wrong model because what aren't you doing? You aren't controlling for the matching. You're actually doing a, um, and you're not controlling for the matching, so you're actually doing sort of a crude analysis on the effect of exposure. Not exactly crude, because you're adjusting for gallbladder status. But you're not doing the matching, so that would be the wrong model, right? So if you want to do the matched analysis, then you have to have that straight a statement in there. If you leave it out, you're not doing a matched analysis. You actually, you will get the wrong answer. You get the wrong answer. You actually got not just like, and it's not like you failed to control for something. It's you will get just literally a weird number that is not the right answer, um, and you will be fired. So don't do that. Not by me, by your, so not, and not by Donald Trump or something. I hope not. I hope he's not in a position to. But anyway, all right. So, uh, so. Um, so another, um, another, there's another way to, you know, we, we've talked about the, uh, you, you can represent the data in some sense, right, through uh, this WXYZ format. And so you can almost imagine, well, what if, um, you know, right, what if I wanted to, you know, what if I had this WXYZ format or this weighted kind of, uh, format here, this is actually a little bit different than WXYZ because we have, uh, I'm representing uh, the two, let's say the two W folks here as two different lines and I say there's 27 people like this and, there's a, and then I have three um, uh, Y folks that look like this um, that are, you know, what if I had weighted data like that? What if I had this kind of weighted frequency data uh, for my analysis. We've seen this actually earlier with unconditional logistic. We had weighted kind of just frequency uh, data where you don't have a lot of other covariates and you're just trying to fit things to this, um, to just uh, aggregate data. And we've seen how to do this in PROC Freak and in PROC Logistic where you can do, a, we, we called it events trials, for example, um, 
in proc logistic. Well, it, this doesn't work in, with the Strata statement. It's all this is the point of what this is to say. You can't really um, do the W X Y Z, or this is a variation of it, where you say I have 27 p con uh, cases that look like this, 27 controls. Uh, you, you have to actually use respondent level data, like real deal respondent level data when you're using the Strata statement. You can't use weights. Um, and so that code that I showed earlier about making a respondent level data set is really important for doing the conditional model. Okay, so, you know, SAS is just, if you say, like, if you have a weight statement, so logistic itself has a weight statement, which lets you put in something like uh, this 27 like this and three like that. Um, it will, it will, it will die if you put that in also with Strata. Like, it's just going to give you, a, you know, an error message and, and yeah. So I just want to point out a few other things. I'm going to run th through these. There's like three other issues in matched analysis. They've actually pretty much all come up so far. Things to keep in mind, things to look at at home, because I want to give this guy a chance to talk. Um, he's already had his chance, but I'm giving him one more chance uh, today. And, um, you know, one is um, interaction involving the, um, involving the matching variables themselves. And so what I'm going to put up here like this is, you know, what if we had a study where we uh, matched on sex, age, and race? These, these folks come here again. So we have pair one, and there are two green women on skateboards, and you know, it's all of this. And what if we wanted to, you know, specifically, you know, look at, um, here, here's our, sorry, here's our matched. What if we wanted to look at the disease, the case, and sex association specifically? Okay, not the exposure. Um, or I'll be just I'll be just walk through this here. We have the disease sex association. Every match set kind of looks like this, right? So here we have um, we we can't do much. We have this is the pair ID one. They're both female, and so female uh, they're both female, and then they they look like this. The case is female. The control is female. Here we have males. Um, the males the the case and the control are both males, and so forth. So we cannot. We cannot look at the association between um, sex and case status, right? This is part of what I was saying. You can't actually estimate stuff based on the factors you matched on. Uh, we matched on we matched on sex, and now we cannot look at the association between case and sex because look, these are all those boring, uninformative tables, right? They're all they're all Ws and Zs, or you know, and we can't do anything with them. Um, and so you get something that looks like this. Um, not you know not. Um, it's not going to be very interesting. Okay, so we can't look at the association between disease and uh, the C variables, and we know that. Okay, but what about looking at effect modification, okay, um, based on these uh, matching factors? Okay, and so I'm going to just throw this up here. Okay, what about looking at the exposure disease relationship? Um, Across uh, across values of sex, and so here I'm not showing. There's no exposure represented in here. Okay, I'm not. These graphics don't show exposure status. But what if in pair ID one, the uh, the pair looked like this, where the case was uh, not exposed and the control was. So this is one of those. Um, um, this is the one of the Ys where they're like this, the Y tables where they're, it's going against the association. Here in pair ID 2, it looks like this and so forth. You can imagine, you could do this in your data and then stratify it by whether, by the, what happens, the WXYZ tables by whether it's male, whether you're looking at male or female uh, matched pairs. Right, so you do your old analysis, but you can imagine, in a sense, you might. What if I stratify this by male, female? Well, I could do that. No one said I couldn't do that. It's conceptually possible. I don't break up any. I, I, the table, the tables have less data, but I could. Right, I can take all of the information after I match and then re-stratify. Right, and so we can do that. Um, we can do this in theory in our logistic regression model too. You could actually put in interaction terms with the matching factors, the factors that were matched upon. Okay, it's conceptually possible. It's not this situation where every pair is the same and you can't estimate everything. Uh, you could imagine effect modification and we can deal with that. And you get a model that looks like, you can get a model that looks like this, uh, where uh, you have, um, 
we have two sets of effect modifiers. One's involving um, the C variables that are used to match. So we have the, the, the our traditional effect modifiers down below, and then ones that were part of matched sets. So you can have age and sex and so forth and other effect modifying terms. So that's one way to think of this model. Um, the problem with this is if I had an exposure by sex term in my model, I don't have sex alone in the model. Right? I don't, it was part of what went into the matching process. You were just pair ID 17 and you happened to be women, but I didn't control for sex as its own entity. And so that, your inner statistician should be screaming in agony uh, because you're not supposed to put higher order product interaction terms in the model without the lower order terms there. That's a problem, and that's what we call the model not being hierarchically well formulated. We're going to talk more about that in a lecture or two. Uh, so that, it, you might get weird stuff because the model is not well, well done. Uh, the other one here is you could imagine effect, okay, you say, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to have the interaction between exposure and the dummy variables for the match sets. And that's just weird. Um, it just, you're not going to, you, we didn't care about the, the V variables themselves and the delta, the gammas that went with those. And we definitely don't, it's going to be very hard to deal with the EW terms. Okay, so um, the next thing is uh, it's ignoring the matching. We don't encourage it. He, he said that already. Um, and this is, I would just look through this and basically we shouldn't do it. You're going to get the wrong answer. Don't ignore the matching. Don't leave out the straightest statement. Uh, breaking the matching, uh, something else we don't encourage. Uh, this is Mr. Subliminal. Do you remember him? I don't know. This is like from like 1980s Saturday Night Live, but he would always say something else under his breath. I don't have time to do it now. Um, <laughs> but breaking the matching is uh, something else that you shouldn't do. And then basically, it's you did a match study and you controlled for age, sex, and whatever inside of the matching idea, the conceptualization of the matching, but then you ignore it and then just control for sex and age as regular old variables in the model. Right? You say, I, I did it in the design phase, I throw that away, and now I'm just going to put in a, a term for sex and a, and a term for age or whatever. Uh, don't do it. So, and this walks through where you can get some weird answers uh, by doing that. Okay, and you've got five minutes. Was... <laughs> five but, minutes, let's see. I got less than five minutes. Can you, can you... Oh, I got five minutes. Okay, okay here's what I'm going to do. Okay, we're done with this. Okay, even though you're not done with this, you might went pretty quickly, right? You had heard this before, but when you heard it before last semester, I also went pretty quickly. So you're hearing it fast both times. Well, maybe both times. I don't know. I don't know what that means. Okay. So let's get out of this. Let me see. Don't save. Don't save. OK. Let's keep that in there. And then let's go to ooh, what, what happened. I want to go to this. Ah. OK. So got five minutes, less than five minutes. OK. Um, I just want to start talking about in just four minutes what the next set of things we're going to be doing in the next couple of weeks. And we're going to be talking about this issue of what's called modeling strategy. Modeling strategy is a very important issue. And, it's, and it doesn't necessarily relate to just doing logistic regression. It relates to any kind of modeling you're doing. It has to do with Given that you've got a question, a research question, you've got a whole bunch of variables, you have an outcome variable, you have an exposure, you may have more than one exposure, you have several variables you want to control for, you've decided you're going to use some kind of regression modeling, whether it's logistic regression or linear regression, which you've learned last semester, or survival analysis, which you're going to learn later this semester. You have this problem where you've got a whole bunch of variables, you have a model, and you've got a question that you want to answer about the model or about the exposure variable, controlling for the other variables. How do you go about coming up with the right answer, the best model? How do you go about a strategy or how do you go about the process of getting the right answer? Okay, that's what we're going to be talking about in the next couple of weeks. Okay. And what we're going to be doing as we talk about it, you're not really going to be learning any new things in terms of uh, how to do certain tests or how to do 
get, you're going to be learning sort of the idea of the strategy. Uh, and one of the issues in the strategy is, well, confounding. How do you assess confounding? When do you assess confounding? Another thing we're going to be learning is, well, where does interaction fit into this? How do you assess interaction in this complex strategy, and when do you do it? So that's what we're going to be doing. Now, the last thing I'm going to say is that I'm going to be giving you guidelines. The last thing I want to do is show you these pictures. Okay? Okay. Now, do you recognize anybody on this screen here? Anybody that you recognize? This guy over here, this is like 1980. Okay? So I had a beard. Okay? <laughs> And Mac, in fact, in 1976, I had a bigger beard, and I looked like Charles Manson. Okay, so, uh, but I wasn't Charles. You know. And this is my longtime colleague and friend, Larry Cooper, who is Kleinbaum, Cooper, Nizam, and, and um, Rosenberg. So that's Larry Cooper back in 1980. So who's this? Nathan Mantell. Who's Nathan Mantell? The famous Mantell, Na Mantell Hansel. Mantell. And I'll start talking about the story next time, but it has to do with a meeting that Larry Cooper and I had with Nathan Mantell about talking about modeling strategy, trying to get the guru back then, and he's still sort of a guru, but he's died, you know, uh, trying to get the guru to tell us how to do modeling strategy. So I'll tell you the story next time. So we're done, okay? Thank you. Sorry, Why not? That's okay. Good. So.